Um, I also want to update you on something that we covered late on Friday night here on the show. Um, it's about the activist group Indivisible that sprung up after Trump was elected over Clinton in 2016. Indivisible is a, a group that we have covered. It's not really a group as much as it is an effort. Um, we've covered Indivisible stuff a lot here on the show because they're a little bit different in their approach to activism and progressive politics, um, and they've been really effective. Um, Indivisible is the group that developed and promoted this intensely pragmatic approach to Trump-era politics, in which they, they train people and equip people and help people organize to communicate effectively with their own senators and their own members of Congress, specifically. People who represent you from your district only. This indivisible model, the sort of playbook for how to do activism in this way, it was cooked up by former congressional staffers who know from personal experience what it takes to actually move members of Congress and get them to do stuff. So you don't, you know, contact the member of Congress who has you mad at that moment. You only ever contact your member of Congress, your senator. You focus on the people who have to listen to you. And they've been very effective. It's been really interesting to cover them over the past couple of years. There are thousands of indivisible groups all over the country, including in every single congressional district in the country. Red states, blue states, doesn't matter. The basic idea is that it's your representative who you need to communicate with. It's your representative who has to respond to you because you are their constituent. That's your only real leverage for this type of political activism. And here's how we can make it work. So we've been watching Indivisible for the past couple of years, organizing events, having an impact in hundreds of congressional districts all across the country. Well, now, um, having had pretty good success with that model when it comes to uh, legislation in Congress and targeting specific members of Congress and specific senators and getting them to change their behavior. Now, this indivisible group is trying to take that same pragmatic Trump era ethic um, and they're trying to apply it not just to Congress, but to the Democratic presidential primary for 2020. So we covered this a little bit late on the show on Friday night. Uh, there is a new We Are Indivisible pledge um, that more than 10,000 people have signed up for already. And there's two versions of it. One is the grassroots pledge, which is just for people, uh, for people who specifically want Trump to be defeated for re-election in 2020. Um, the grassroots pledge, the you know, regular people pledge, uh, is three parts. Number one, make the primary constructive. That's the headline. We'll make the primary election about our hopes for the future and a robust debate of values, vision, and the contest of ideas will remain grounded in our shared values even if we support different candidates. So this is, again, people who want Trump to be defeated, we will support each other even when we have differences of opinion as to which Democratic candidate is the right one. Number two, rally behind the winner. We hereby pledge to support the ultimate Democratic nominee, whoever it is, period. No Monday morning quarterbacking, no third party threats. And three, third part of the pledge, do the work to beat Trump. Again, they're asking regular people to sign on to this pledge, right? So in this case, the, the, the grassroots pledge is we're the grassroots army that's going to power the nominee to victory. We will show up to make calls, knock doors, and do whatever it takes. Which means don't just talk about this stuff. You have to pledge to actually do something. So. They're, they're, those are for, uh, that, that is an effort targeting regular people um, to sign the grassroots We Are Indivisible, Indivisible pledge. But then they're also asking all the Democratic presidential candidates to make what is essentially the candidate's version of that pledge. Um, and you see the main points match here. It's another three-part pledge. And the headlines are all the same. Number one, again, make the primary constructive. And the candidate's pledge says, quote, I will respect the other candidates and make the primary election about inspiring voters with my vision for the future. I will respect the other candidates. So no tearing them all down, right? No tearing each other down. Keep it a constructive primary. Number two, again, same headline from the other pledge, rally behind the winner. And the candidate's version of that says... I will support the ultimate Democratic nominee, whoever it is, period. No Monday morning quarterbacking, no third party threats. Immediately after there is a nominee, I will endorse. Hmm. So this is a very specific thing they're asking all the candidates to pledge to. And then finally, number three, again, the same headline as the other pledge, do the work to beat Trump. But for the candidates, right, this is a different kind of pledge. This is a very specific thing. Quote, I will do everything in my power to make the Democratic nominee the next president of the United States. As soon as there is a nominee, I will put myself at the disposal of the campaign. 
So this is not an like, you know, airy fairy aspirational pledge. No offense meant to airy fairies um, or to aspirations. I mean, this is a really specific commitment for specific action by all of the Democratic candidates, right? Immediately after there is a nominee, I will endorse. As soon as there is a nominee, I will endorse and I will put myself at the disposal of the nominee's campaign. I mean, that's a lot, right? I mean, candidates often, the first point, yeah, candidates often get asked to be positive and construct constructive in the campaign, and they all say sure and then do whatever. But they don't usually ask you to sign on the dotted line to say you will endorse by name the nominee as soon as he or she is chosen. I will put myself at the disposal of the campaign immediately after there is a nominee. That's what these candidates are being asked to do here, again, by indivisible. And because this is such a specific request, right? Because this is such a specific testable thing that they're asking these candidates to do, I was not sure that Indivisible was going to succeed in getting any of the Democratic candidates to sign on. It's very interesting to me that they are having tremendous success with this. Uh, they unveiled this thing on Thursday, and on Thursday, bingo, they got their first candidate to sign it, Bernie Sanders. He was first. Fascinating, right? And still, at that point, maybe you think, okay, maybe it's only going to be Senator Sanders. Maybe, you know, because of leftover feelings from 2016, maybe he alone among all the candidates feels like he has the most to prove about his ability to bring his supporters over to support an eventual nominee if that eventual nominee is not him, since he was the last man standing when Hillary Clinton got the nomination. Maybe that's a hangover from 2016. Maybe it's just Bernie. No, he was the first to sign on the day the pledge was unveiled on Thursday of last week. But then on Friday, Cory Booker signed it, and then Jay Inslee signed it, and then Julian Castro signed it, and then Pete Buttigieg, and then Elizabeth Warren, and then Kamala Harris, and then this weekend on Saturday, Amy Klobuchar signed, and then Tim Ryan signed, and now today, Kirsten Gillibrand signed, John Hickenlooper signed. It is, it's getting to the point now where candidates are not just signing this, they are photographing themselves signing it, photographing their signature on it, putting it out on social media, let, let it, letting you know that they have made this pledge. Which means like, a majority of the Democratic candidates right now have pledged that as soon as there is a nominee, they will endorse immediately. They will completely put themselves at the disposal of the campaign of the nominee, no matter who it is. Full stop. And I fully believe in the timeless adage that in the primary, you vote your heart, and in the general, you vote your head. Um, it is almost always folly to try to like game it out, right? during the primary to try to pick a primary candidate who you're going to vote for, not because that's the candidate you like the most, but because it's the candidate who you think will ultimately be the most electable candidate in the general election at the end of the day, the candidate who you might think would have the best chance somewhere down the line at unifying the party after the primary and bringing all the disparate strands of the party back together to make a unified effort. I mean, honestly, you can, you can try that. But I think it is easy to overthink these things. And I think in the primary, you vote your heart. And in the general, you vote your head. Um, but pragmatic as ever, here's Indivisible, nevertheless, taking this concrete effort and this thus far surprisingly effective effort to put concerns to rest about whether the primary might be divisive, about whether the whole Democratic Party will end up pulling together in the same direction once a nominee is picked, no matter who that nominee is. It's one thing to worry about. It's another thing to do something about it. Well, again, they've got more than 10,000 regular people signed on to their grassroots version of this thing, but the candidate's pledge already has 11 of the 20 declared Democratic candidates signed on and counting. And for now, at least, that means they've got a majority of the declared Democratic candidates for president signed on. Although mathematically, that may change um, when the denominator moves, right? When, when inevitably, yet more candidates get in. I mean, they've got a majority now because they've got 11 candidates have signed on out of 20. We're probably going to end up with more than 20. Uh, Politico.com reporting this morning that Montana Democratic Governor Steve Bullock may be getting ready to join the race as well. He at least is moving staff around and seems to be gearing up for something. Colorado Democratic Senator Michael Bennett may yet get in as well. He has not been shy about talking about his interest in the race, but as yet we have not heard uh, a declaration from Senator Bennett as to whether or not he's going to run. Uh, the former Democratic leader from the Georgia legislature, last year celebrated Democratic gubernatorial candidate in Georgia, Stacey Abrams, says that she will make an announcement about her political future by tomorrow. Now that is widely expected to be an announcement about whether or not she's running for Senate 
in Georgia, but there is also an active betting pool, uh, proverbially speaking, uh, as to whether or not that announcement from her might actually uh, be a presidential announcement. So I don't know what number of candidates we will ultimately end up with on the Democratic side, but it is getting to the point where it's clear, you know, we're no longer in the pregame, <laughs> right? This, the actual competition has started. This thing is underway. I mean, just a quick snapshot of what's going on. Like, it's clear this is happening now. It's, it's, it's on. The fight is joined. This weekend, the Bernie Sanders campaign held nearly 5,000 organizing kickoff parties. They were in all 50 states. That's an average of like 100 events per state. Joe Biden today held the first rally of his campaign, held it at a union banquet hall in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Biden starts his campaign at the top of most polls and with a big fundraising bang right out of the gate, he raised $6.3 million in his first 24 hours. Now, as of today, we get to see Biden as a candidate. We get to see how he performs both on, on polls and otherwise, not as a, polit uh, as a potential contender, but as some, somebody who's really running. As of today, he's really running out there doing his first rally today. Today, we learned that Kamala Harris just made a big and potentially important hire for her campaign. She just hired Obama's ad maker from both the 2008 Obama campaign and the 2012 Obama campaign, which means that Kamala Harris has now hired him. It also means that that ad maker wanted to be working for the Kamala Harris campaign at this point in the primary, which itself is interesting. Mayor Pete Buttigieg today was in Harlem in New York City, talking with Reverend Al Sharpton at the Harlem Institution of Sylvia's. Uh, we know from intense reporting, some of which took <laughs> took place through telephoto lenses shot through the window right next to them, uh, that Mayor Pete had fried chicken and collard greens and macaroni and cheese, while Reverend L, look, had dry toast because, oh my God, the willpower. <laughs> God bless you, Reverend L. There is no way I could do that. Julian Castro was in Las Vegas for an SEIU event, a union event this weekend that attracted a whole bunch of candidates. While Julian Castro was there, look at this. He toured these storm drain tunnels under the Las Vegas Strip. Um, this is what he posted online, quote, many don't know this, but beneath the massive casinos Las Vegas is known for, hundreds of homeless residents find shelter in a network of storm drain tunnels. People live in the storm drain tunnels underneath the casinos. He says, yesterday I toured these tunnels with local organizations working to find them permanent housing and support. We must do more to end homelessness in this country. On my campaign, housing will not be a back burner issue. Julian Castro, of course, was Secretary of Housing and Urban Development in the Obama administration, so he knows of what he speaks. Uh, Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren, by all accounts, was very, very, very well received at that SEIU event in Nevada this weekend. Um, we saw a lot of early uh, kind of facile beltway punditry about Elizabeth Warren's campaign, saying that uh, voters weren't going to like her, her focus on policy and having concrete diagnoses and proposals and plans on so many different issues. Voters won't like that. And given how Elizabeth Warren is performing in the primary at this point and how she is being greeted at big important events like the She the People event in Houston where she brought the house down and the SEIU event this weekend in Nevada where she did the same, uh, that punditry about how people don't want to hear about these plans of hers um, seems to have been off base. The Warren campaign has in fact now updated their merchandise to reflect the fact that people do like that she's got a plan for everything. See the t-shirt there? Warren has a plan for that. ElizabethWarren.com. New Jersey Democratic Senator Cory Booker turned 50 years old this weekend. He asked people who support his campaign for president to spend 50 minutes doing some sort of service project to benefit their community as a uh, basically a birthday present for him. Judging by the online reception that idea got, seems like lots of people took him up on that this weekend. Today, both Telemundo and Univision aired long interviews with Senator Booker that he conducted in Spanish. Uh, which is something, not something that people widely know about him, that he is conversant in Spanish, but he's able to do Spanish language media now uh, without a translator in a way that is going to be very helpful to his campaign, both early on and down the road. And again, that is just, that's a snapshot. That's not even everybody and everything that's going on right now, but like this thing is on, right? The fight is joined. This thing has started. And, and other than that indivisible pledge, which I just described with, with 11 of the declared 20 Democratic candidates signing on to this pledge that really does lock each of them in to endorsing the eventual nominee as soon as the nominee is chosen, putting themselves at the disposal of the nominee as soon as that nominee is chosen. 
on top of that, which I think is fascinating, seeing that thing take off, there's really there, there's two other things in today's news about the 2020 field and how the election is shaping up that are particularly interesting to me. Um, one of them is actually just data. Um, Open Secrets just published this fundraising data about what proportion of donations um, each candidate is raising from women versus from men. And again, this is a snapshot. This is not all of the candidates. Uh, th their data, they, they just looked at people who had declared in the first quarter and who had raised a certain threshold of amount during that quarter. Um, but it gives you a snapshot that is really interesting um, and gives Democrats a lot of room to grow. There is only one candidate among all of the declared Democrats who thus far has raised more money from female donors than from male donors. Kirsten Gillibrand is the only one. Uh, her donors are 48% male, 52% female. Other than that, every other candidate in the race skews, even slightly, but skews more male in terms of the donations that they have received thus far. I mean, most voters are women. Most Democratic voters are women. Most Democratic donors are women, right? And so this is interesting. In a race when you've got a half dozen top tier Democratic female candidates who are running, almost all but one of the candidates are raising more money from men so far than they are raising from women. And the, the other end of the spectrum, if you, Kirsten Gillibrand's doing the best in terms of targeting female donors, but look at the other end of the spectrum. Just strikes me as unsustainable, right? I mean, right now, both Bernie Sanders and Pete Buttigieg, they're doing great in terms of donations overall and buzz and polls and press, like they're doing great. But look at them, both of them are two to one in the gender balance of their fundraising. Both of them are raising twice as much money from male donors as they are from female donors. 66 and 67% of your donations are from dudes? Dude. Uh, Bernie Sanders had a gender split in his fundraising in, when he ran in 2016 as well. Um, that, that split that you're seeing so for him thus far for his first quarter, 26, uh, for his first quarter for 2020 is worse than the gender split that he had in 2016. Uh, and that dynamic, which I think is surprising given the, given the uh, central importance of female voters, female donors, female activists in the Democratic Party in particular, um, that's surprising data in terms of the fundraising so far. Uh, it relates to the other development in today's election news that I find absolutely fascinating. And it really underscores why all of these Democratic candidates are going to need to turn that around in terms of appealing to women voters. Women are the majority of Americans. We are the majority of voters. We are the majority of grassroots volunteers and donors. Our government should look like us. Nuestro gobierno debería de parecerse a nosotras. The only way we can make that happen is by standing shoulder to shoulder with women who believe this too. Maybe you fought for change for decades. Demanding equality in your home, in your workplace, from your government. Maybe you're just getting started. Let's work together. Because one of us can be dismissed. Two of us can be ignored. But together, we aren't just the majority. We are a super majority. And we are unstoppable. This is the announcement video for a new project, which was launched today, which is called Super Majority. Uh, it was launched by three superstar uh, female activists, including Cecile Richards, who you know from her 12 years at the helm of Planned Parenthood. Uh, Super Majority is the name of this organization that they launched today. This is a very different kind of thing that we have seen from Cecile Richards before, but she is in pretty astonishing company in terms of the women that she is working with to start this thing up. Cecile Richards joins us to explain next. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.